courage to change. And today we're going to resume this series. And out of the chapters we've looked at so far, we found principles and insights uh, that uh, help and challenge us, those of us who live today in Aotearoa. So uh, we've looked at the leadership journey of Joshua as he guides the nation of Israel into the promised land. And who of you have heard some of these messages? Uh, Craig and Monica and Rob Stacy. Okay, there's a few hands. Okay, all right, there you go. All right, so in the book of Joshua, this land is known as what? What's the land known, the promised land? Canaan, that's right. And the land of which today encompasses Israel and the West Bank and Gaza, the southern uh, portions of Syria and Lebanon, and then northwest Jordan. And here we are more than 3,000 years later, and fighting is still happening in this part of the world. And so why don't we stop now and pray for this conflict that's happening, which we hear about so often and so tragically, really, in Israel and Gaza. Let's pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, last weekend we celebrated you. We celebrated your death, your resurrection. Lord, you are the risen Lord. You're the exalted Lord. You have the name that's above every name. And Jesus, we thank you that we can lift up to you Israel and Gaza and what's happening there. And we thank you that you love th these people. We thank you that you have plans and purposes for this place. We thank you that you care for every person. And we thank you, Jesus, that you're the Prince of Peace. And so, Lord, we pray for peace to come to this part of the world. We pray most of all for your kingdom purposes to be outworked, that those of our brothers and sisters who are laboring to make you known and to alleviate suffering and just to make a difference, that you would prosper and bless them, we pray. And so, Lord, may your kingdom come and may your will be done. In your name, Jesus, amen. All right. Well, listen, when we think about uh, your family, your friends, uh, your workplace, your school, or even here at BBC, uh, if you've ever had a misunderstanding with another person, can you put your hand up, please? Okay, yep, that's right. That's because that's, 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 that's all of us. Of course, all of our hands went up there. Uh, and today, you know, we're going to dive into this really interesting and unusual story uh, of two groups of God's people who they end up having this massive misunderstanding and they end up nearly killing each other. It's, it's an unusual story in Joshua chapter 22 that I hope we're going to gain some insights from that are going to help us to think about courageously navigating misunderstanding. Because in this story, things get so escalated that someone's going to need courage and they're going to need to navigate this misunderstanding well. But before we can launch into that, and because some of you might be new to this series, I want to give you some, some background, which I hope is going to be helpful. So it's going to be up on the screen. So here's a bit of background. From Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 onward. Genesis, Genesis 3, verse 15 is when God speaks to the serpent and says, you know what? Someday this seed's going to come, and you're going to bite him on the heel, but this seed's going to crush you on the head. All right? And so it's this opening salvo in the Bible that God becomes very committed to, to bringing a Savior one day. And the Savior is going to restore friendship between God and human beings. And indeed, the Savior is going to bring restoration to the entire creation. And what happened last weekend? Well, we celebrated, didn't we? Jesus' death and resurrection. And uh, because of that, people can now have friendship with God, which is amazing. And we can participate in Jesus' mission of reconciliation and restoration. And that's just fantastic. And I hope all of us here are in some way involved in that. Like we just saw Judy on the screen, and we can think, wow, Judy, great for you. But the fact is, each one of us can make a difference wherever we are, just like what Judy does. Well, I've gotten ahead of myself a bit. All right, let's go back to this little bit of a background about Joshua 22. Well, let's continue on with this thing of Genesis, where God promises Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he will bless them and multiply them, and that he'll give them some land. And God gives Jacob a new name, which is what? Yep, there you go. It's Israel. And um, his descendants end up in Egypt as slaves, as we know. And God brings the nation of Israel out of Egypt into a covenant relationship with himself. 
and he guides them eventually to their own land. And the book of Joshua is about Israel's conquest of the promised land. And by the end of chapter 21, uh, the tabernacle, uh, where God dwells, the Ark of the Covenant, very special thing. They're at this place called Shiloh, and Shiloh is kind of roughly about 43 kilometers north of modern-day Jerusalem. And most of the tribes of Israel, they've been established in their locations, their promised inheritance, which really is a big theme of the book of Joshua, right? And the map up on the screen, it gives you a bit of a visual as to where the tribes ended up, okay? Particularly take note on the right-hand side of the picture, because there's three tribes that, uh, well, you maybe quite, can't quite see it, the Jordan River, which is a north-south important river, of course, in the history of Israel. On the right-hand side of the Jordan River, you have East Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben. And they are the three key players in our story today. And the fact that they're on the, the east side of the Jordan River is going to be a very important um, detail in the story. So take note of that. What we're going to do is we're going to dive into the text. And we're going to read quite a bit of the text. So if you're not ready for that, I'm, I'm telling you now, brace yourselves, all right? Because we're going to dive a bit into the Old Testament. And we're going to hear it read out loud. And as you hear it read out loud, just let it impact you because maybe something's going to jump out at you. We're going to start at verse 1 of chapter 22. So it'll be up on the screen. If you have your Bible, you can read it on your app or an actual real printed Bible. That's quite amazing. All right, verse 1. Then Joshua summoned the Reubenites the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and said to them, You have done all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded, and you have obeyed me in everything I commanded. For a long time now, to this very day, you have not deserted your fellow Israelites, but have carried out the mission the Lord your God gave you. Now that the Lord your God has given them rest as he promised, return to your homes in the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. But be very careful to keep the commandment of the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you, to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commands, to hold fast to him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Then Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their homes. But, but it's a case of, but wait, there's more. Verse 7, to the half-tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given the land in Bashan, and to the other half of the tribe Joshua gave land on the west side of the Jordan, along with their fellow Israelites. When Joshua sent them home, he blessed them, saying, Return to your homes with your great wealth, with large herds of livestock, with silver, gold, bronze, and iron, and great quantity of clothing, undoubtedly obtained from Talula. All right? And, and uh, divide the plunder from your enemies and your, with your fellow Israelites. So the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh left the Israelites at Shiloh in Canaan to return to Gilead, their own land, which they had acquired in accordance with the command of the Lord through Moses. All right, so you with that so far? Well, that was what's happening. All right, let's come to verse 10. When they came to Geliloth near the Jordan, as in the Jordan River, in the land of Canaan, the Reubenites, Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an imposing altar there by the Jordan. And when the Israelites heard that they had built the altar on the border of Canaan at Geliloth near the Jordan on the Israelite side, the whole assembly of Israel gathered at Shiloh to go to war against them. There you go. So the Israelites sent Phinehas, son of Eleazar the priest, to the land of Gilead, to Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. With him, they sent ten of the chief men, one from each of the tribes of Israel, these are the ones on the west side, each with the head of a family division among the Israelite clans. Well, let's stop there. And you're probably glad about that. All right? Now, does that sound like tense or what? Right? As we reach the end of that. Uh, it's incredibly tense. But really, what's going on here? Right? It's hard for us today to really dive into a story like that that's from the ancient world. Uh, and frankly, you guys, it's like getting Chiefs fans in the same room as Crusaders fans. Uh, it really is. Or even worse, Blues fans in the same room as Crusaders fans. All right? But both Chiefs fans and Blues fans are very happy, right? aren't they, right now? But listen, getting back to our passage, it's clear that there's a major conflict that is about to erupt. What's going to happen? 
uh, the Western tribes believe that the, the center of the worship of the Lord, Yahweh, their covenant God, is under threat due to this rival altar that's being built. And these men of the Western tribes, they're so upset that they're prepared to fight and kill the very men with whom they had just fought alongside for nearly seven years. So just think about that, because that's kind of what's happening in the story, is that for close to seven years, they've all, they had to fight together to in, inherit the promised land, all right? And these men would have had a really special bond that's just completely unique to war, to fighting side by side and then surviving that war. Right, so for, so for this to be happening, it's pretty remarkable. Well, in fact, our whole country is going to honor people like that in a few weeks' time, aren't we? Because veterans are special people for many reasons. Uh, but veterans also share a bond that's unique to surviving war together. And in this story, with the West Side men wanting to kill their East Side brothers... Uh, it'd be like New Zealand Anzac veterans finishing a war and then getting so upset about something that they want to mow down their Aussie Anzacs. That's kind of what it would be like. And I could, I could see that over stealing Pavlova, couldn't you? You know, maybe, maybe. Uh, but seriously, for us today, the story in Joshua, uh, it's pretty astounding, really. And so what happens? What happens? Uh, fortunately, wisely calmer heads prevail, and the West Side men, they send this delegation to verify the assumptions or even judgments that have been made about the competing altar to the Lord, all right? And so rather than reading out loud the 14 verses about this war summit, I will summarize them for you. You can see them on the screen behind me, all right? So here we go. So as I said a moment ago, uh, the Israelites on the west side of the Jordan River, they're extremely upset because they think their east side brothers have built a rival altar to the Lord. And during this tension-filled meeting that happens between these two delegations, they realize that there had been assumptions and misunderstandings, and basically they just kind of get put on the table, and things get sorted out as they listen to each other. And the east side men explain clearly that their large altar is to remind them and their descendants to worship the Lord and keep him central. It's not about replacing the altar at Shiloh. And we hear them say this in verse 29. So this is what the east side men say in verse 29. Far be it from us to rebel against the Lord and turn away from him today by building an altar for burnt offerings, grain offerings, and sacrifices other than the altar of the Lord our God that stands before his tabernacle. And what happens is the West Side guys, they accept that. They accept that explanation. And basically, they just patch things up, and they go their separate ways. Uh, and so really, we have these two groups of God's people who are both extremely zealous for God. One group heard a story, made some assumptions, and in modern English, we'd say they jumped to a conclusion. And then they went on the warpath. All right? And fortunately, they slowed down, they asked some questions, and they listened well. And they realized that they had completely misunderstood the intentions and motives of their East Side brothers. Well, has a situation like that ever happened for you? Probably. Well, listen, let's hear how this story and how the chapter ends. Uh, we're going to read Joshua 22, verses 30 to 34. It'll be on the screen. When Phinehas, the priest, and the leaders of the community, the heads of the clans of the Israelites, heard what Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh had to say, they were pleased. And Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the priest, said to Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, Today we know that the Lord is with us, because you have not been unfaithful to the Lord in this matter. Now you have rescued the Israelites from the Lord's hand. Then Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, and the leaders returned to Canaan from their meeting with the Reubenites, Gadites, in Gilead, and reported to the Israelites on the west side. 
They were glad to hear the report and praised God. And they talked no more about going to war against them to devastate the country where the Reubenites and the Gadites lived. And the Reubenites and the Gadites gave the altar this name, a witness between us that the Lord is God. So that's the name they gave to their altar. It's a witness that the Lord is God. All right. Are you still with us? Yeah? You hanging in there? All right. Listen, there's plenty that we can take out of this story. There's actually quite a bit we can take out. But I'd like to remind you of a small but important fact that I mentioned before. Uh, it was the Jordan River that uh, divided these tribes, and it was both a geographic and a symbolic boundary between the tribes. And so in this story, the Jordan River is an important character, although it's, it's a silent one. But it definitely makes this huge difference. Because sitting underneath this story is the belief that the west side, the western territory, is superior. Especially due to the proximity of Shiloh, where you have the tabernacle and the, the Ark of the Covenant are there. And by the way, it's going to be years later uh, that Jerusalem becomes the capital and center of Jewish life. And for now in this story, it's up in Shiloh. All right, so what does this story from more than 3,000 years ago have to do with us today? And that's a good question. And in fact, uh, this morning I was praying about this, and I want to welcome those of you that have joined us online. I had a really interesting thing happen for me today. At 4 o'clock this morning, I was awoken with a, an actual very vicious and oppressive demonic attack. And I wondered about telling you all about that. But that, that happened. And it was pretty nasty. And I had to call on the name of the Lord to kind of push away this thing that was uh, harassing me. And I feel that there's someone here today, you're either here in this room or you're watching online, that this message is for you. And God has something for you that he wants to touch you and do a work in your life. And so I just mentioned that right now. And you know why that is? Because we all experience misunderstandings pretty much all the time, unfortunately. And I want to draw our attention to a few insights that we can gain from this story. Firstly, isn't it incredible how quickly a misunderstanding can turn a situation negative or even toxic? You ever experienced that? Okay, I'm the only one with my hand up here. All right. So just think how quickly negativity and outrage just travel on social media, for instance. And as we know, this is so common that misunderstanding basically is the currency of unsocial media. It, it really is. Uh, and, you know, years ago, I lived in the USA. It's where I got my accent back, by the way. Um, is I worked in IT, and I worked in a, in a skyscraper uh, where our company took up the whole floor of, of a building. And we had lots and lots of employees on this floor. And there was so much stuff that went on all the time. So much misunderstanding, so much gossip, frankly, so much crap that went on, uh, is that I wondered how any business ever got done. Yeah, any of you can relate to that? Yeah, yeah, there was just so much misunderstanding. And so that's why we've got a picture of the office up there, right? I think it's going to come up on the screen. There it is. That's right. You get 30 minutes into a meeting and you realize, oh my gosh, uh, way back at the start of this meeting, I misunderstood something. Uh, and I can relate to that picture. Well, listen, amongst us Christians, us Christ followers, there's plenty of things about which we can be very passionate. Is that true? Yes. And as we know, Christian history does not make for happy reading at times, as the so-called people of God have fought about matters of faith and practice, or even just about the color of the carpet, right? That has happened. And um, in church life, we have a lot that unites us, none more so than our shared faith in the amazing Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Yeah. And the fact is, you guys, the life we enjoy here at BBC, it's quite remarkable. It's a daily miracle. It really is. Because just look at us. We come from just a, such a diverse background uh, with, with our own personal spiritual stories and histories and cultures, and languages. Uh, we're, we're a really diverse bunch. And yet, what is it that unites us? What we all have in common is that we've come to know Jesus for ourselves. Is that right? Yes. 
We've come to know Jesus. He's real to us. We've come to know him for ourselves. And the life of God and the unity and joy in the Holy Spirit that we enjoy, it's truly remarkable. It is truly remarkable. Why do I say that? All you have to do is be part of a church conflict or a church split and endure the horror of that to, to in contrast to that, appreciate when you have joy and peace in the Holy Spirit and unity in the Holy Spirit. That is a taonga. That is a treasure. And God wants us to treasure that. He does. Because God has created and is creating something special here. And it's up to us to be the stewards and caretakers of that. But as we know, we have an invisible enemy. And unfortunately, we each have a sin nature. Well, at least I do. I might be the only one here. Um, but therefore, the potential for tension and conflict is just never far away, is it? It can just sit just under the surface where something can trigger it. And it's a lot like the story we read today in Joshua 22, because that's what happened there. You know, and I don't have to reach back very far to remember the trouble that was stirred up by this invisible virus with the nasty spike proteins on it, right? Remember it? And we, it, I know it's kind of, well, my wife was like, are you sure you want to mention this? Well, I am. Um, yeah, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because suddenly and unexpectedly, all these beliefs and ideas that were just operating under the surface, they suddenly just whoop, came out into the open and they exploded into the open. And for us who were in church leadership, we were confronted with types of conflict that we just could not have imagined like one year earlier. It was, it was a crazy time, as we know. And, it, and obviously there's a lot that could be said. But for me personally, you know, to have a church member with whom I had previously had a very warm and friendly relationship, to have that person come up to me and wave their finger in my face and yell at me, well, that was a unique experience. That was an entirely new experience. And for me, it felt like an altar at the Jordan experience. Why do I say that? Well, because it was just like this massive misunderstanding that just incredibly got out of hand. And so we found ourselves having to courage, courageously navigate misunderstanding. In fact, all of us here had to do that. Especially us as church leaders, we had to do that. And so for us today, I want to offer a warning. Here's the warning. Beware of little Jordans. Beware of little Jordans. Because little Jordans come along quite unexpectedly, don't they? Uh, where something happens and you have a misunderstanding that takes place. And it might be because of assumptions or judgments. And you got to watch out for them. I've been in local church life for as long as I can remember. And the, and the years as they've gone by, I've come to realize that it's the majors in the Christian faith that are way more important than the minors. And can I hear an amen from someone? All right, there's a few of you, right? And that's, it's because it's Jesus who unites us, the Jesus we were just singing and worshiping to. It's Jesus whom we love with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's Jesus whom we are serving. It's Jesus whom Sunday... We long to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. It is our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that unites us. Let's keep it that way. Amen? Let's listen to this practical wisdom from this guy called Robert Hubbard. This slide's going to be on the screen. One implication of the episode in Joshua 22 is that ultimately we Christians should trust each other and give each other the benefit of the doubt. The care of the church belongs to Christ. Therefore, rather than confront each other over every little thing, there are times to simply let things pass because we trust each other and we trust the unseen work of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that good? You know, we trust each other. And here at Bethlehem Baptist, we place a high focus on trust, on trusting the Lord and trusting the Lord in each other, right? Because Christ in you, the hope of glory is in, e in each one of us. And so one of our joys as staff members is working with people like you, where when you guys serve and we serve the Lord together, and we do that because of trust, which is so great. But then sometimes we do need to have crucial conversations with each other. And have any of you ever experienced a crucial conversation? Okay, I don't see any hands going up, all right? And um, 
These are conversations that might be hard. And, and often they're hard because our world today denies there's such a thing as absolute truth. And yet for Christ followers, it is loving for us to speak and act in truth with each other. And so I want to offer you a few practical tips. Here we go. Here are some keys for you. That, to have a courageous, crucial conversation, it's always way better than misunderstanding. Is that right? It's certainly better than going to war, like we heard in the story today. For Christ followers, this means humility, empathy, and active listening. Humility means just having the willingness to set your own agenda and rights aside and take a servant attitude. Empathy, to connect with someone in a way maybe you never have before, which is not so easy to do. Active listening, to really truly listen to what the other person is saying. Is listening a great thing? It really is. It's so powerful. And for instance, in the story we read today, it made all the difference. It's allowing the other person or the other side to fully express their perspectives. That can take time, and that can be hard work. And for Christ followers, it means speaking the truth in love or truthing in love, as you could translate it in Ephesians 4, verse 15. What's that? Well, that's being clear while being loving. These men that were about to kill each other in our story today, they really just needed to set it aside and have clear, honest, open communication and just and accept that from each other. And then it's about being the change that we want to see in our marriages, our families, our workplaces, our churches. How does that sound? We saw Judy Hayden, this amazing lady that's doing amazing things in Southeast Asia. Well, guess what, folks? You are missionaries, and you are in a mission field. When you leave this place this coming week, you can make a difference right where you are. Is that right? Yes, you can. You can be a change agent. You, you can be the person that makes the difference in your marriage. You can push through a misunderstanding, an unforgiveness, a hurt, something that just needs some attention, but maybe I've been avoiding it. And the story today is to say, please stop avoiding and take action, all right? Um, Jesus said this in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 to 25. Jesus said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower... You must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If you try to hang on your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but are yourself lost or destroyed? Well, I want you to hear this a slightly different way, this quote from this man called David Benner. It's going to be on the screen. The Christian life is filled with little deaths and little resurrections, little Good Fridays and little Easter Sundays. Each embrace of my cross is a further step into the kingdom of God, a kingdom we can reach only on the other side of the death of our kingdoms and queendoms of self-sufficiency and self-determination. How's that? Yeah. Well, I want you to hear this quote from this guy called Charles Hewlett. He's our national leader, and he says this, We've been called to be the church in a country that mostly rejects the Christian message. The idea of a meta-narrative or overarching faith story is often viewed as ignorant, arrogant, and oppressive. But New Zealand Baptists must be countercultural and recognize as people who love Jesus and are quick to reference the Bible as we graciously work to restore all that is broken. Amen to that. And you guys, when people outside of these walls, when they see us making a difference, being the, the change that we can be, that's attractive to them. And they, they want to say, they will say like Phineas in our story, the Lord is with them. The Lord is with you. He's with us. And people will want to join us because they want what we have. And so I was challenged today in Joshua 22, and I hope you too, or I want you to ponder these questions. What might God be saying to you today? And what can you do tomorrow or this week to courageously clear up a misunderstanding? Or to be a peacemaker by demonstrating the sacrificial love of Jesus. Would you just stand where you are and just stand quietly? Just stand quietly as I pray. God, we thank you that you see our lives, you see our marriages and our families and our workplaces, our neighborhoods. And we thank you that you've brought us into your eternal family and you want us to, to be, make a difference 
because we know you and we've experienced your forgiveness, your grace, your love, your kindness. I pray your blessing on every person here today, God, with whatever they've walked in with today, that your Holy Spirit will touch and fill them refresh, that you will bless them and make us a blessing as we go from this place. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and God's people said, amen. Well, listen, thank you for being with us here today. Thank you for coming. Please feel free to come up for prayer. If you, we have a prayer team, if you want to pray with something or to hang out in the cafe and just have a good, share, good time of sharing with each other. May the Lord bless you and give you an excellent week. Catch you later.